A quorum is not present of the town council, but I am still going to call the meeting of the town council to order at 10.30 a.m. It is not technically a meeting because we do not have a quorum, but no business, no formal business and votes will be taken other than who will pre preside. But we're not, um, we're still going to hold our meeting. Um, it just won't be formal. So we still don't have it, a quorum even with Kathy here. The first thing we need to do, I am presiding in the absence of our president, Lynn Griesemer. I am the vice president of the town council. It is October 16th. Um, I am not able to stay for the meeting. So under rule 3.1 of the town council rules of procedure, I am going to call for nominations to elect a president pro tem for this meeting because I will be leaving and we need someone to run the meeting. Do I hear any nominations for a president pro tem? Uh, Dorothy. I nominate Andy. Do I hear a second to that nomination? Second. Do I hear any other nominations of a president pro tem? Andy, are you willing to accept that nomination? <laughs> I, I will then call for a vote on the president pro tem to run the rest of this meeting on October 16th on electing Andy Steinberg as president pro tem for the October 16th, 2019 non-meeting meeting of the town <laughs> council. All those in favor, say aye. aye. <laughs> it, it is unanimous of those that are here. Andy did raise his hand, so I am now formally passing the meeting over to Andy and taking my leave. <laughs> I think that uh, our course of business is to hear from uh, our principal assessor, Mr. Burgess. And uh, so I will turn the meeting over to him to make his presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to introduce, I've got my board of assessors with me, and Mr. Morse, who is our chairperson. Mr. Hargreaves is a member, and Mr. Hines, who is behind me, is the third member of the board. Uh, they have been with me about three years in total, four years. Yeah. They've done this a couple of times. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is actually just to give you a little bit of an understanding of what we, we are going to ask you to do on Monday night, which is basically agree with us for the tax rate being a single factor and no other exemptions being raised. Please remember, anything I say today is a, or on Monday night is a recommendation. You are the only folks that are going to make a decision, so you can change this at any time. Uh, that's a lovely slide, but I think we'll go to the next one. <laughs> this basically just tells you the options we have. Uh, we're going to vote on whether we have a single rate or a split rate on Monday for between commercial and residential. And then the other exemptions are open space discount, small commercial exemption, and residential exemption. I'm only going to touch briefly as we go through this on the open space, on the open space and the small commercial, because we don't have any. So we'll deal with that as we come to it. And the next slide: the uh, total assessed values are determined. You, we must have this public hearing. This is the law. Every year we have to have it. I will provide you. Sorry. Someone will provide you the information uh, to the council to make classification decisions. The town manager and I are not required to make a recommendation, but we may. The next slide is basically just the excerpts of the law that allows you to do this. Um, and it tells you a little bit more information. And I'm not going to go through that. On the next slide, we show the Classification Act came into being in 1978, and we have four classes of property, residential, commercial, industrial, and personal. Uh, the guidelines for that are set by the, the Department of Revenue and not by us. By the way, as I go through this, if you want, I'll ask, answer questions, or we can just do questions at the end, whichever is easiest. Next slide, please. There we have the definitions of the different types of property, and basically residential property, and the only thing I'm going to tell you different, not different, but explain on the residential property, that apartment complexes and multiple units are residential property. Massachusetts assesses based on use, and that is a residential use for the apartment complexes. 
Everything else is fairly self-explanatory, except for the commercial, which will throw in the um, chapter lands, which is chapter 61A, 61, 61, and 61B. And those are, get special treatment uh, because of their requirements. The next slide. This is going to show Question. you what our... So, uh, it says commercial, and then it's, it lists forest land, farmland, and recreational. Yeah. Did you say those were exceptions, or those were included? Those are included in the commercial, because they're generally for commercial use foresting or uh, farming, which is they consider because recreation. I'm not quite sure how it's commercial, but they just put it there. <laughs> of course, we do have golf courses, so that will be part of that. Uh, this slide shows the breakdown for the town of uh, the amount of property. And our total property valuation is just over 2.5 billion. Of that, 2.29 billion is the residential. 194 million is the commercial. 87 million is uh, personal property. Uh, the 4.7 million is uh, industrial. Industrial land, it's a very small sliver. We couldn't get colors, quite the contrast. But we have 6,219 residential properties. 490 commercial, 29 industrial, and 108 uh, per, sorry, did I say commercial? Commercial, industrial, and then personal property. Next slide, please. This uh, graph is designed to show you the breakdown of um, the tax classification distribution uh, between commercial, industrial, personal, and residential. And as you can see, Residential has remained relatively steady at 80% for the last 10 years. And we have about 20% of the other three classes. Which comes into play when we decide to talk about the tax rate coming along? Next slide. Uh, this is really what the hearing is about, and whether we're going to have a split rate tax rate or a single tax rate. When you we bring the LA5 to you on Monday night. You're going to see talking about um, selecting a, ta a factor. A factor of one means that all the property classes will be assessed equally, or sorry, will have the same tax rate. A factor of less than one means that we would raise the residential taxes. Yeah. And a factor of uh, greater than one would mean we're raising the commercial taxes more and splitting them. The All the way around, yeah, I knew that as I started saying it. <laughs> yeah, correct me. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, on the next page, the factor of one will result in an estimated uh, tax rate for FY 2020 of 2136. Please remember when we talk on Monday night, this is an estimated tax rate. And it has changed since I started doing this document. Uh, we've, it's a moving target until we finish with the Department of Revenue. We're projecting now a tax rate of $21.32, not $21.36. So this is an example for you. Uh, for comparison, these, this is Amherst neighbors ranked uh, for tax rates for 2019 and the commercial tax rate for 2018 as you can see, several of them, Holyoke, Westfield, Chicopee, West Springfield, are very large commercial tax rates. Next page, please. This shows you an example of what the residential tax rate would do if, if we make the complete change to 150%. The average single family home in Amherst this year will be 374,000 valuation and a tax rate of 2136 will generate $8,004 in taxes. If we adopted the split rate, the tax rate would drop to $20.02 per thousand. That's uh, for $7,502 for a decrease of $502. Commercial valuations, the average is 524. At the 2136, it's 11,209. At the, one, uh, the, the next tax rate at 150% is 3203. It's, it's an increase of $5,599. Yes? 
Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And for the industrial, our industrial average is 164,000. Now that's very low, but most of our industrial is land. Uh, and at 2136, it's 3513. And at the 3203, it's 5277, or an increase of uh, $1,764. So you can see splitting the tax rate between commercial and residential would be quite significant to increase the commercial properties. Next slide. Uh, this is just a breakdown of uh, communities that have a single versus split tax rate. And as you can see, the FY18 is where the user year used. And there were 236 of that uh, single tax rate. There were 110 that split the tax rate. And then there were an additional um, five, because five, five tax rates because they either adopted a residential or a commercial exemption. And basically, that is the end for that. And we, I and the Board of Assessors and the manager all recommend a single tax rate. <laughs> These are the other exemptions that are allowed, and this is the one that I believe we're going to talk a little bit more about than the others, is the residential exemption. Oh, sorry. Next one. No, it does not. Sorry, you were right. The residential exemption allows for a shift of the tax burden within the residential class from the lower valued properties to the higher valued ones and those owned by non-revenant residents. However, this also shifts the burden of rental properties. Residential exemption is a statewide exemption. We can use up to 35% of the average assessed valuation of a residential property to calculate this. This is a fixed amount of money, not 35% of each property that gets the exemption. And this automatically raises the tax rate within the residential class only. It does not impact the commercial, industrial, or personal classes of property. Next slide. Take a minute on that. So you're saying this is in power right now. This right now we have a residential if it's owner-occupied? No, we, do. we have no exemptions in the town of Amherst for owner-occupied or commercial or any other thing like that. So then this is brought up as something that you could do, but yes. we don't do. Okay. Well, haven't done. <laughs> so, it gives an advantage. I mean, I'm, it's hard to read it while we're going on, but if it's an owner-occupied property, you would pay a lower tax rate. For the majority of people, yeah. but at a break-even point, even the single-family owner-occupied property will pay more. I don't get it. You don't get it? No. Okay. It Justice. This does not help an owner-occupied house, you're saying? It, it does not. helps the majority of the owner-occupied property. Okay. But when you get up to somewhere about $450,000, anyone with a valuation over that, even if they get the exemption, will pay more because the tax rate has increased. Right. But this would help houses under that, <coughs> that point. Yes. Okay. But it would penalize apartment complexes and things like that. Okay, I, I have a, a couple questions on this. When I went and I read um, MGL C59 section 5C, um, it said uh, it's the owner occupied, but it's only the property that you use for your principal residence. Correct. So when you, so I, my first question is when you, I, I realize you're doing a, a rough estimate of what these are, but if, uh, some of the properties you said people might own two or three houses, but it would just be the home that they lived in and had as their principal residence that would get this exemption. Is that right. correct? You're talking about two or three houses on the one lot? Uh, yes, or they own two or three houses. You know, so if they own two or three houses on separate lots, they would only get the one exemption. If they own multiple houses on one lot, they would just get the one exemption for the property in total. Okay. We, it's a little bit complicated because 
We t uh, most people talk about uh, residential properties. We talk about parcels, and every every exemption impacts the particular parcel, not the individual uh, house that's on it. And so, just just on following that up, when you've done the calculation, um, the the reason that rate is going up, uh, as I understand it, is because you've still trying to get as much total revenue out of the tax assessment, so you're giving some a break. Um, but d does the apartment dwelling, does its rate go up more? So can you split the rate, no. actual rate, within the residential class was the question. No, what would happen is you would change the rate within the residential class. If you look at um, oh, this Right. You know, I was trying to follow the math later, but I just, you know, so if a large apartment complex, say one, one is pleasant, you know, has multiple, yeah. um, they don't get the exemption. They won't get the exemption. But the rate becomes the same rate for them and the homeowner, and just yeah. the homeowner gets the exemption, so you, yeah. can't split, you can't split the rate within the residential class. That's okay. So, okay. And do any towns do this was my last question. Oh, yeah. on. There are several towns do this. I think there's about 11 in total across the uh, country, or state, and um, about, I think there's about 11, yeah. And most of those are communities that have also got a split tax rate, because if you split the tax rate, and some of them go up to 75% on commercial, if you do that, even with the, sing with the higher tax rate within the residential class of property, Everyone pays less taxes in the residential class because of the way it works. And the majority of those properties have more than 30% commercial, industrial, and personal property. At the maximum, we have 20%. Uh, so that's something to remember as we go along. Uh, the re Could I just go a little bit further because there is more sure. in here? Okay. So if we go to the next page. Uh, this is briefly, I'm going to touch on the small commercial exemption that is for a property with a valuation of less than a million dollars that someone owns and has um, 10 or, uh, people, or no more than 10 people working for them. We simply don't have any uh, because most of our properties are rental properties. You've got an owner and then you've got business people occupying them so they wouldn't qualify. Uh, then we have the open space exemption. <coughs> Uh, which we didn't touch on here because we do not have op any open space class property and that is a board of the assessor's decision at this level for classifying the properties. <coughs> if you look at the next page, this is a breakdown of how we have the parcels in the uh, town of Amherst for the residential only and the, and the mixed use because they have some residential parts to them. And as you can see, there's 6,277. And this just gives you a breakdown of the percentages of each class of property and whether they are likely owner-occupied or not. Uh, on the next page, this is a single-family home frequency. It basically shows you what levels we have properties at. And obviously, in the, between the two and $300,000 is the largest property. Uh, class, and believe it or not, we do have a residential property valued at less than uh, almost $1.4 million, a single family. So we have uh, over a million dollars, we have five of them all together. Just, we didn't have that when I started here, trust me. Um, if we go to the next page. This is a uh, pros and oh, Before I go any further, I'm going to tell you, I didn't do all this by myself. I had a lot of help, particularly from Athena. And then Mr. Hargreaves came up with a lot of the information that we had coming along. So I'm not that good with computers as she is. So the residential pros and cons. The majority of owner-occupied properties would benefit, and this would likely help first-time homeowners. Non-occupied properties uh, would pay increased taxes. That's a con. Owners of these properties may increase the monthly rent. The benefit is not income-based, so anyone can get it. 
Um, sh it shifts the burden to the higher price to homeowners. Now, I will say this, this will put a, quite a considerable burden on the assessor's office uh, at the, the first year we do it, because even though we're estimating and we do have some reasonable information, we haven't updated it in quite a while, so we would need to do that. If we did not do that, that would cause the last one, which is an increase, we would have to put more money into the overlay reserve, because people have the right to apply for an exemption. If we didn't give it to them and they think they should have got it, they have 30 days to apply after the tax bill goes out. So it's for the sake of argument, uh, if we had 100 of those, you're probably looking at it another $25,000, $30,000 in the overlay. So we would have to increase that. And I'll be happy to over -ex explain the overlay if, no one, if you do not know what it is. So I can tell you what the overlay is if you don't know what that is. Okay. The overlay reserve is an amount of money that the assessors request each year and uh, from that's figured into the tax uh, rate. At the moment, it's a little over $500,000 a year. And that money is to allow us to pay for exemptions for the personal uh, people who qualify and abatements that people may get during the year. Uh, we have a conser conservative overlay amount at the moment, but obviously we, would, we need to cover it. So if anything was likely to change, we would have to put more money into it to see what's happening. Any money that's not spent it will eventually return back to the budget. <coughs> Next page, please. Okay, here's the fun part. <laughs> to arrive at the figures in my estimates, I used 10% exemption, 15% exemption, and 20% exemption. As you can see, at 10%, any property that qualified for the exemption would receive 36000 500. At 15, it's 54,000 plus, and at 20%, it's 73,000 plus. We have about, well, 6,283 residential units. I changed that around, but of these, approximately 4,316 would qualify for the exemptions, and 1,967 would not. If we use that amount above, the tax rate, I used last year's tax rate of 2180. If we used 10%, that tax rate would go to 23.56. If we used 15, it would go to 24.54. And if we used 20, it would go to 25.62. And before anyone says anything about the $25, yes, because of exemptions, we can exceed the $25 limit. This is a little bit fast for me. This is if you're giving a homeowner exemption for an owner-occupied house. Correct. This is the changes that would happen. Um, it would lower the taxes on the cheaper houses. Is that correct? Of the, of the 4,367, any, 4,316, anybody below a valuation of $487,000 that qualifies for the exemption would pay less. Now, it could be pennies less. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with the 15%, that number changes to 3,795. And at the 20%. That number is not honest. It's after the. Four last paragraph. Last paragraph. Yeah. Okay. So if you had a 20% exemption of a house below $450,000, how much money would they save? How much money would they save? Yeah. In the last year's, uh, if they qualified, it would be $1,500. That's money. Yes. But the other thing is, once you get in. Going up of the ways over the 4,000, That's at the bottom end, mm -hmm. but with the tax rate, once you get into 400, dollars, they will not save any money, and anybody above that will not save any money, <coughs> and the chances are that people in the last quarter of that 4,000 would have only saved uh, a few dollars or a few pennies. But but on your chart, you had the majority of houses were below 450,000 dollars. Yes, but they don't all qualify for the exemption. Well, it, it, it looks to me that people who have houses that are valued lower might be people who would really like to save on their taxes. So you're not convincing me it's not a good idea is all I'm saying. I, I'm not going to try and convince anybody of anything. I'm going to put the facts before you. But the other, the other side of that sort is 
all the low income housing in the apartment complexes are going to pay at the higher tax rate. When the time comes, most of these apartment complexes are going to have a tax writer. In other words, if the taxes go up, your rent go up, goes up, and your lower, uh, your, lower va your lower earning persons will be in those apartment complex and they will pay more taxes. So that's, uh, I understand what you're saying with the single family, but you know, there's a wider board as well. Um, if we go to the next page. This illustrates the 20% residential exemption, assuming a 2019 tax rate. Properties under 100,000 and under with that exemption would save 300, um, 691 dollars and 28 cents and if you go all the way down and follow that second column all the way down this is the changes in the taxes um, so it, the apartment complexes a 10 million dollar apartment complex is going to pay an additional 36,329 dollars and 28 cents and the non-owner occupied one would pay 38,200 if you look at the $400,000 range, I'm, I'm talking with the last two columns here. If you look at the $400,000, that person would save $342, and then at $500,000, they'd actually pay more at $39. So that's where the break even point is for everybody. And if we go to the last page, or not the last page. We have never adopted a residential exemption. This is only an explanation. Many communities have split tax rate, which affects the impact of the residential exemption. Uh, we were particularly asked about Cambridge when we talked with Ms. DeAngelis. Uh, Cambridge had a single, uh, if Cambridge had had a single rate last year, their tax rate would have been $8.37 per thousand. But they shifted under the commercial rate by 64%. So the commercial rate went to $13.71 and giving a residential rate of $5.84. If the residential had only been granted, it would have been $6.86. So even with the tax rate at $6.86, that is lower than the original $8.37 because of the split tax rate. And even with the exemption and because of the split rate, all residential paid less. Cambridge has a 65% commercial base as opposed to Amherst 10% base of, uh, or so. Even with a split rate in Amherst, the exemption would cause higher taxes for some of the residential class. And the residential exemption in some of the communities along the coast was simply put in place to impact the non-resident year-round property owners because as they came into town, they paid, raised the values of the properties and they were only there part-time. So the residents decided that they should pay more taxes, which I think seems fair. Uh, so the recommendation of the manager, the assessor, and the board of assessors would be a single tax rate and no commercial or small exa uh, residential exemption. The last page shows you a breakdown of this year's uh, valuations. And as you can see, 90% of it is residential. 88.78% is residential. Uh, so that's where we are. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them. Not a question, but a thank you for answering my prior question okay. and focusing me on the impact of rental tenants. Okay. Thank you. I, um, I have a question. Um, in the beginning, you talked about per, personal property, and you said roughly 188 parcels. Yeah. What, what is personal property? And in this last one, its total valuation is... 87 million. You said it's mainly utilities, but... Um, well, the, 
the value is mainly utilities. We've only got five or six utilities uh, that qualify for utilities. We'll have Berkshire Gas, the uh, Western Mass Electric Company, and then we're going with the telephone company. It's not really a utility, but it's valued by the state and our biggest player, our, one of our biggest taxpayers. And then we have several smaller communication companies now that are all, we classes, call them utilities. And they, they make up roughly $75 million of the valuation of the 87 million. The rest of them are all small businesses, uh, such as the mom and pops across the street. And they pay on, uh, on their inventory and the machinery and equipment, and there's uh, all their countertops and things like that. So all those are paid for. Okay, so they, they pay on the equi some equipment inventory inside as well as the property? Well, they don't pay the property tax. The, pro the property owner pays the property okay. tax. Okay, because they're renting. They will be paying some of it in some way. And a solar field, would that be personal property? Would that be industrial? What would that That's be? Personal. Personal. And we had, those are under pilots, which are payments in lieu of taxes. But because of the way that the Department of Revenue has told us we have to do it, a normal pilot is outside the tax rate. <coughs> These pilots are inside the tax rate. So we have to calculate a value for them every year and put them inside the tax rate. And I believe we're about $7 million in those altogether for the four we have at the moment, with more coming. And then my last question is the two big um, institutions that aren't taxed in town, Amherst College and UMass, do you ever do an evaluate, a value assessment of the value of what? their land plus buildings are. That's question number one. And the related question is to the extent there are commercial activities on those properties that are not specifically teaching, um, have we ever looked at, could we be taxing that part of the enterprise separately? And I've just seen a few communities, Princeton had a challenge on this, um, for example, in the town of Princeton. Um, have we ever looked at that? Have we, the first is have we assessed the value and secondly have we said some of what you're doing looks pretty commercial, it's not just teaching? Yeah. Yes, we've assessed the value. Not UMass because we haven't got all their buildings online but we have for Amherst College and one thing in LA, uh, Hampshire College. Uh, and we do that simply to have it. In all honesty, from the point of view of an assessor, those are special use buildings. I really am just putting a construction cost on them more than anything else. Um, they don't really have a market value. And yes, we have looked at the, com uh, resident, the commercials on the, res on the exempt properties, and we do have a few properties that are taxed for, by, uh, to Amherst College, and we have some uh, banks taxed at UMass. We have to tax the leaser, you know, the leasee, not the leaser in those cases. So UMass is not taxed, but the bank is taxed for ATMs and things like that. If, and I'm doing this as a hypothetical, and we'll bring it up, because I know it's not the topic we're doing now, but if you said they were operating a food service as a commercial, that it wasn't just purely UMass, could you come in and look at the whole thing and say this is unrelated business and should, should be taxed? Yes, we could. Okay. Well, I, I want to say that I think that this might be a good year to do a owner-occupied house um, exemption because we are talking about our major projects, our capital projects, and we're discussing the property a possibility of a um, tax um, override and which where the taxes will go up on on houses. So, I think maybe we should think about that. Uh, as I said, that's up to the council. But as I also said, our information isn't exactly up to date on the owner occupied or not. I would ask or suggest that if you were going to do it, you would consider it for next year and give us the chance to get all the information in place. So it would make more sense to me. But again, we can do it. Can we do it? Yes. We can do it. You had a comment, but you need to come up to the microphone just because they're recording it for... Uh, I think David did an excellent job overviewing. Oh. I think Dave did a great job giving you a 
the background of all this process. Uh, a couple of quick comments. One is, this is tax policy, and this is the council's decision to decide, you know, who benefits, who pays. And, and Dave went over what exceptions or what options you have, uh, and you have to decide that. I'd 100% support what David says. Get all the facts together. So if you want to do this, get all the facts together next year so you're prepared next fall. And also Amherst is very much, they like to be involved in processes. So you'd want to involve the town in this process. Um, the other more technical point of view is when David's talking about parcels, those are parcels, taxpayer parcels. So you might have one apartment with 300 units and that's just one parcel. So you need to understand you know, the effect when you go through this. Um, the other um, data we'd want to get more facts about would be, you know, the, it looks like the majority of the housing units in Amherst are rental right now. Again, this is without research, but it looks like that. And it looks like a majority of those rentals are occupied by students. So again, that's information you'd want to understand better to understand what's going to happen when you start, you know, having apartments pay more. Is it affecting students? Is it affecting elderly? Is it affecting affordable? What's happening there? So again, um, if you want to do that, I'd put something in place next year to have the information available for you. Yeah, I think that uh, in my one hesitation about uh, taking over as Chair Pro Tem today was because as a member of the select board, I'm the one who's actually dealt with this issue in prior years. Um, and uh, so I'm going to switch roles for a second. When the select board looked at this each year, it's not something that we just automatically did because it was recommended. But there were a couple of things that were ultimately important considerations. One is the uniqueness of our community and the distribution of residential to commercial. We really are tipped very hard, which makes it hard to have a split tax rate. So that was one part of it. As far as the exemption was concerned, uh, ultimately each year when we did talk about it, factors that we were looking at was do we know enough about the properties that would be affected at the high end because some of them are owned by people who have owned for generations and um, are living on fixed income and so that you really take a great risk of affecting people who are on uh, fixed income and ultimately then you come into the disruption factor and uh, when if you make this change it could have a huge disruption piece and uh, th whether that's a desirable thing to happen is something that uh, now the council is the board that's going to have to make that consideration uh, and I think there was one additional piece which you alluded to, which is that, uh, yes, um, number of renters are students. Uh, students are a part of our community, but the number of the renters are really low income. And people who are living on uh, very restricted income, and uh, if you start looking around at some of the apartment complexes, they're not all students. Uh, Colonial Village for, uh, is one example that I would throw out um, for consideration. And uh, we have to realize that uh, anything that would shift uh, taxation to the rental properties, uh, we have to be aware of who the tenants are and what the effect might be on the rents. And those are not easy considerations to make, and, but those are the kinds of things that we probably were struggling with each year. Kathy. Um, in, in the spirit of the strong recommendation of um, get our facts before we make any decisions, um, 
the point Andy was just making, I went back to your graph on the distribution of um, property values and homeowners. It looks to me, if I said, uh, just picking one, properties of $700,000 or more, we might end up with there are 150 of those or whatever the number is, so it's not 2,000. Could we be doing an inventory both of how many are homeowners, you know, as you said, you know, versus rentals, but of those that have a high assessed value that look like they're homeowner, would we be able to do an interview, get some assessment so you're, you're house rich but income poor? Um, or is there no way of getting that kind of information? Yeah, well, we could get the information, but you can't do anything about the assessment because the assessment is going to be based on the market value. Right. And I'm, I'm just saying purely that we would say, you know, we've got a couple hundred of these or a hundred of these that are the, you've lived in your house forever and the property is, is worth a lot, but you're living on Social Security income. You, your income is low, so we, we think we're hitting a high income person, but we can't target, I understand you can't target this. This is not targeted at all. We are allowed to ask for an, uh, inf income information, but it's only ask, we can't compel. We could definitely take a look and see what would happen. Look around to see if there are additional questions from <coughs> council. In, in New York City, there are uh, tax exemptions based on, on income for senior citizens. And I, I know from a previous meeting with you that we do not have that in Amherst, but there's a policy where some people can work it off, which I think meets the needs of some people but not of others. Well, actually, we, there are several state exemptions that we have, and Amherst has always voted for the highest one. Uh, we have an exemption for a blind person. We have exemptions for... Um, Persons over 70 years of age, but with income qualifications, so we can do those. We have an, um, an exemption for a uh, surviving spouse, and as long as they uh, don't remarry, that's, that's in place. Uh, we also have several veterans exemptions, different classes. And Amherst, over the years, this is one of the things you will be asked for on a yearly basis as a town council to vote on, has adopted the optional exemption that allows us to raise those by a, a hundred percent over a period of time. Uh, I would need to say. Uh, Amherst has adopted the optional exemption that allows us to increase those uh, state exemptions by a hundred percent over a period of time as the taxes raise on a property. So we have a, we have put a lot in place over the years. Uh, and Amherst has always been very receptive to everything we've put forward. Okay. I would, uh, first of all, we need to just reflect for the minutes that as of 1115, uh, we now have a quorum of the council present. So we actually. No, no. no we don't. That's right. Okay, we're still up. And I guess the other is. Um, because Man when Mandy left, I was uh, elected under the council you rules as. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, we've gone through. Uh, we had previously received in the packet the um, same slides that we have been looking at and asking questions about today. We we're trying to isolate the. Uh, the help of uh, Mr. Burgess, the decisions that the council will make when it has to have the tax classification hearing so that we can understand what each of the factors are. I think that the other point, just to let you know, is that the recommendation was that if we are going to consider any significant shift in policy, that we not do it in the first year, but that we ask for the information to be developed um, so that council fully understands the consequences of the decisions that it's going to consider. Uh, and that's the mostly the residential exemption question. Um, so I think inside. So. Go ahead. No, I'm just agreeing else? with you. <laughs> so
So are there other questions? That I just want to echo Pat's thank you. I, I actually found these tables very clear and very useful to be seeing how the interaction with the rate happens, because it wasn't obvious to me until you, you did the work of showing this. And I like the last column, which shows the actual tax change on it, so you don't just look at the rate, but you see minus your exemption, you're still, a lot of people are still paying more. So I thought that was very useful. Thank you. So, uh, the council will feel that there's additional information that is going to be helpful because we do have the tax classification public hearing scheduled for October 21st, and uh, would you move? Would you move your mic closer, please? Uh, the ta just a reminder. Of the Tax classification hearing is scheduled for 6.30 p.m. on October 21st. And we want to make sure that um, we have, at least from this group, a sufficient understanding of the issues that we will be considering. And I think that the other factor, in which gets back to uh, Mr. Burgess's recommendation about fully developing an understanding amongst ourselves of what the ramifications of a change of policy would be. So we probably, as a uh, council, might want to consider what steps we would want to do to um, inform the public about what we're considering and the possible consequences because of the uh, if, if we institute a major change uh, based upon prior experience, we don't get a lot of public that comes to the public hearing, but if there's a lot of notice that, hey, your taxes might change significantly, that could change a whole lot. And uh, so I would uh, also encourage the council when it gets to it to think about the kind of advanced public notice it wants to have because um, one question that came up was what do we know about the individual circumstances and the effect on individuals uh, and uh, having advance notice out to the public will um, inform people and, and they will come and tell us if, if it's going to affect them significantly. And that's something the council might want to hear. Yeah, I, I, yes, Kathy and Ren Okay, Dorothy. the one suggestion I might have for the hearing is to have in your back pocket, if you don't have it already, the chart you have which shows residential rates versus commercial. Yeah. You can eyeball back and forth, and you can see the communities that don't split them. Um, but your point about those that have gone higher, so Cambridge, for example, have a huge commercial property base. Yeah. It might be used to have that as a background if someone asks about it. So, you know, they're able, so I was going through, like, Greenfield doesn't do it, Northampton doesn't do it, you know, I was, and I was just doing by this is the same number in both charts. Yeah. But the chart's not easily set up for that, but just be ready to have that, not just the Cambridge because it, it looks like um, Agawam, a few others do a split rate, and I'm assuming that what you said is often true for these others, that they've got a, a decent enough a commercial base to be able to do that split rate. Yeah, the, 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 for the split rate, that's correct. The idea of Cambridge was to show what would happen with the split rate and the residential exemption. Agawam and all the rest of those communities out here, we do not have uh, uh, residential exemptions in any of those communities. Okay. So that's why Cambridge was uh, si si signaled out. Okay, and so that's the only one that actually has the residential exemption also of that chart? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. Dorothy. Well, I was, I was speaking up for some, uh, an opinion that has been voiced here many times by Sarah Schwartz, which is that many people that she knows say that if the taxes increase, they'll be forced to move. And so I assume those are homeowners. So I, I, I do think it's something that we have to think about seriously. Yeah, uh, yeah we hear that, hear that quite a bit. 
and uh, it's not one of the things we have no control over. And I'd just like to say uh, to Mr. Steinberg, uh, I'm not sure if it was before you were on the uh, select board or just after you came on the select board, but we did do a major study of the residential exemption at one stage about 15 years ago, and there was quite a turnout from the uh, apartment owners <laughs> who weren't amused. They, uh, they, that's the people you're going to hear from in the apartment complex owners when this comes out. As you look at that chart, an apartment complex owner of $30, $10 million is going to pay an, an extra $38,000 a year. And that's a lot of money. Yeah, but that's who you'll hear from. Anything else? Yeah, Evan. Yeah, well, uh, one thing I almost forgot about. Um, so the tax rate is decreasing 2% from last year? Yes, the tax rate is decreasing 2%, but by, uh, in turn, the residential values are going up by 6%. So when the values go up, the tax rate goes down. So that, that's what happened. Um, we are on a five-year cycle at the moment. And if I had left it this year, our valuations would have been, would have been roughly 90% of market value instead of a 95%. And right or wrong, I didn't want to leave that for the next assessor coming in. I'd rather push it up and get it back to where it should be and give them three years to work with it instead of coming in and having to make an adjustment next year. So. Yeah, I think that it might be coming. I see you're about to raise something too. Um, I think most people don't understand the 2.5% increase applies to the amount of total taxation that we can make to the community so that as property rates, um, as the assessments increase because property is more valuable in a community, um, that means that the rate goes down. Um, it's just... Uh, but uh, there's a, another factor that we as a council ultimately have to be aware of because we're in a regional school district and um, not um, how property values are changing within each of those four communities is not the same. And that's part of the tension that goes into the regional assessment discussion which is a separate process, but then comes back related to what we're talking about here. Uh, Mr. Bachman. So, anything else? Because uh, I don't think that going back to the agenda for today's meeting that there's Anything else, unless there's public questions, but uh, public is really the uh, Board of Assessors, and I really appreciate all of your being here. And on behalf of the councillors present, I want to thank you for being here and for all of the work that you do uh, to make this tax system work and work fairly. And um, then to be prepared to handle the appeals process should that come about, which the greater the disruption we throw into the system, the burden's going to fall back on you. And so I want to recognize that and appreciate your service for the community by being on that board. Anything else from my councillors, members? If not, then uh, I think we can. Uh, Declare ourselves adjourned. <laughs>